Hi, my name is Ed Nolan and I am an A-level psychology teacher and in today's video we are going to look at the idea of science versus non-scientific approach when evaluating the approaches in psychology. Now we're really excited because if you look at the picture there around us that is Wilhelm Wundt's um, laboratory that he opened in 1879 in Leipzig in the university there is the very first laboratory in psychology, first experimental laboratory. And Wilhelm Wundt is seen to be one of the fathers of research psychology. He mainly was a cognitive, took a cognitive approach there, but um, really that has set the scene for psychology and how we try and use the principles of science to support or to find supporting evidence for our theories. And I love all of the equipment and kit they've got. They've even got a picture of the brain at the back. Right, let's look at two psychologists first. This is John Bowlby here. John Bowlby was a psychodynamic psychologist who was interested in the impact of early experience on a children's criminal behaviour. Um, and he looked at this idea of the affectionless psychopath. Um, I'll just hide Adrian for a minute. The affectionless psychopath. This idea that um, if a child is deprived of its mother, that it then struggles to form empathy and understand um, others and therefore more likely to commit crimes. And he did this, he investigated this by um, talking to the children, interviewing them. He did try to have a control group, a comparison. He did try and use other measures, but his evidence was based off his interpretation of those children, of what they said and what was going on. He took a very subjective way and not what we see as a scientific approach to investigating human behavior. Whereas Adrian Ray is different. Adrian Rain is a biological psychologist. And what's interesting, Adrian Rain is from Darlington, where I teach, which is quite exciting. But he used PET scans to investigate the brain of murderers. The view that the structure of someone's brain influences the likelihood as to whether they commit a crime or not, particularly murder. And so he took a very scientific approach, comparing it to a control of, of 41 other individuals and comparing their brain activity and taking very nice, precise, objective measurements. So it wasn't based off his interpretation, it was based off what his PET scan, his machine produced on the activity of different parts of the brain. Two very different ways of looking at criminal behaviour. By the way, Adrian Rain was also interested, or is also interested in this idea of psychopathic behaviours, coming in from a very different point, from a neurological rather than experiential viewpoint. But which one has the most valid evidence? Let's have a look. That's what we're going to investigate today. Now, first of all, when we're talking about scientific, we've got to say, well, what is it? What does it mean to be scientific? Well, let's see what the Cambridge Dictionary has. This idea that knowledge from careful study of, sorry, of the structure and behaviour of the physical world, and we humans are part of that physical world, us, especially by watching, measuring, and doing experiments, and experiments remain part of that and this idea of development of theories as a result of the activities. So instead of saying, here's a theory, let's see if I can find some evidence, we'll say, let's investigate something and let's create a theory from it. And that's what we're doing when we're being scientific. Now, this idea is what's called as nomothetic. This idea that a research psychologist who takes a scientific approach wants to establish rules of human behavior, how people behave. Um, so saying, if my participants behave in this way, we can then apply that to the rest of people generally on what we want to do. And most psychologists would take that. They want to establish how humans universally behave, how they think, what causes them to act in the way that they act. And they do that by carrying out experimentations and those forms of research. So. If you are taking a scientific approach, there's two aspects that make it scientific that I would go through. One is the way that data is collected, that it is done in a controlled way. So this idea that we control all of the eggs here, they're all the same size, to establish which one would be red and which one would be white. Okay, The egg is not there laying the nest with the chicken. You know, that actually we've done it in a clinical and controlled environment. And we do that to get rid of extraneous variables so we can make firm conclusions on cause and effect. But the other aspect to being scientific isn't the how we conduct the research, but it's how we measure the behavior or whatever it is that we're measuring. 
So if you're doing it in a scientific way, you need to do it objectively. So just like Adrian Rain used his PET scanner uh, to identify the levels of neural activity. That was his measurement. It objective means there is a stand aside universal measurement rather than an opinion or a judgment made by a person. OK, so that's what makes it scientific. Well, what about unscientific? What does that mean? Well, first of all, some non-scientific psychologists, not all, are what's called ideographic. The idea that you have to look at the individual to understand them rather than creating rules of um, human thoughts and behaviour. Not all non-scientific psychologists are ideographic. Some are non-scientific because they just can't investigate what they want to investigate scientifically. So let's have a look at this. First of all, non-scientific psychologists will look at the idea of the complexity of human behaviour. They're very fluid investigations, meaning they will allow all of those extraneous variables to be part of their study because that is real life. Real life is complex. So they won't try and control anything. They allow it and they will change their investigation to match what it is that's going on at that time. It's very fluid, no control, not very structured in the sense of a scientific experiment. But also we're talking about this idea of the subjective measurement. And this might come in two ways. The first way is to do with the researcher. The researcher, if the data collected is from a researcher's opinion or observations, they have looked at something and saying, I'm interpreting that and I think this is the way it is, it becomes sub subjective. They try and objectivize it by using rating scales and by operationalizing variables clearly. However, if there is an element of their judgment gone into interpreting to, to create the data, that is subjective. But also, it's to do with the participant. If your data has come from a participant where they've offered their viewpoint or their idea or their feelings, that becomes subjective as well. There is a biased judgment from the participant. So if I wanted to find out the strength of a relationship that somebody has with their mother, they will tell me either through a rating scale or spoken, they are making that judgment. That becomes subjective. So in non-experimental methods, things like questionnaires, things like interviews are used. Um, which give open responses, which require the judgment of both the participant in the answers that they're giving and also in the researcher on the answers that they're interpreting to create that data. OK, so I've called this a scale of scientificness. It's not a real word, but I've created this. So where do each of the approaches lie? Well, the biological approach, because it is looking at um, physical subject matter. It's looking at hormones, it's looking at brains. It can be measured in an objective way. And so we've got Adrian Rain on there. He was very objective, even though his study was um, a quasi-experiment, so we can't really make firm cause and effect um, kind of conclusions. We can say that the way he measured it was using measuring neural activities using his PET scans. And like other biological psychologists, we're going to put them right at the end. Now, the, the behaviourists, they, they want to be um, scientists. That's what they want to do. They want to use quite clear principles of pure science um, to establish um, their, their evidence. And if we look at Skinner, you know, rats in a box pressing a lever. Great, it's all controlled. You, you know, the rat either press the lever or not. Brilliant. So we're putting them right up there. However, some behaviourists still need that element of judgment. So if you think of Albert Bandura, you know, looking at the aggression of children, there was still a judgment by the psychologists whether they were aggressive or not. And so although it was a controlled study, there is that still that little bit. So we're going to put them right at the end of scientists, but maybe not quite as clear as the biological ones. And I think the same thing goes there for the cognitive psychologist. So we've got Elizabeth Loftus there trying to use an experimental technique, trying to control the variables, trying to establish cause and effect um, in her experimental work as a cognitive psychologist. Just an interesting point. Elizabeth Loftus is good friends with Adrian Rain. Um, they're just thought well, I mentioned that. Oh, by the way, I've met Adrian Rain. So that means Elizabeth Loftus and I are good friends. Um, well, maybe not. Anyway, let's carry on with this. So I can hear you saying, but what about the two other approaches? What about the positive approach? 
Well, the positive approach I'm putting in the middle, they want to use the principles of science. They want to find the best evidence. They want to find most valid, straightforward evidence they can. But positive psychologists will also acknowledge that the things that they are looking at sometimes can't be measured objectively. So if we look at there, there's David Myers there um, from his study, and they were looking at happiness. Well, how do you measure how happy someone is? Well, you've got to ask them, really, haven't you? You've got to get them to rate themselves. That then suddenly becomes subjective and the science drops slightly. But they're trying. They want to be in that camp with the scientists. However, Let's not get rid of them. Let's press the other button. Let's look at John um, Ball be there and the psychodynamic approach. Well, they would say, look, the things we want to investigate, the unconscious mind, relationships, things from the past cannot be measured in an objective way. It's got to be got to ask people. We've got to make judgments. You cannot do it. And so they will actually they have given up some of the scientific principles in order to get to the area that they want to investigate, something that cannot be measured objectively and controlled in the laboratory experiment. But don't forget, Sigmund Freud was a scientist. Sigmund Freud was a doctor, a medical doctor, and did medical research prior to his work as a psychotherapist and his work in psychology. So they still have that training. Okay, so Adrian Rain and our scientific approach to research, why do they do it? What's good about it? Well, first of all, if it's well controlled, well structured, you can repeat the study. If you repeat the study, get the same findings. It's reliable. And of course, being reliable is good. You know, the idea that if something consistently happens, then that, that must be something real. We can trust it. We can work with that. So they are, there is reliability there. Also, this idea that if we're controlling variables, we can establish cause and effect. If we can establish cause and effect, say one thing causes another to happen, we can make predictions. If we can establish that the frontal cortex here is linked to aggressive behavior, then people who have a less active frontal cortex, we can predict that they may be susceptible to being aggressive. And so that is a good thing. Whereas if we don't have that scientific aspect, if we haven't established cause and effect, can we make those predictions? Can we trust those predictions? We're talking about trust. This idea that um, we can apply stuff. You know, if I want to take on a new therapy or if I'm a head teacher and I want to take on a new learning technique in my school, or if I'm in a business and I want to apply a new way of selecting my employees, or if I'm a, a football coach, or maybe I'm the manager of Everton Football Club. Anyway, if I was and I wanted to apply a new training regime, I want to know there's some evidence that that thing is going to work. That it's not just some guy asking a few people and saying, yeah, yeah, it looks about right. No, I want evidence. I want to make sure. And if I can make sure that it works, I can then use that to improve whatever it is that I want to do. I think the last area is this idea of respect. It's something a bit more abstract and vague. But this idea that psychology needs to be scientific if it wants to be accepted, if its ideas need to be accepted. So it's this idea that you are given respect. So one of my lecturers at university used to walk around in a lab coat. Now, I don't know why there were no chemicals in our psychology area at university. I didn't see any blood. Hopefully that wasn't it. But why did he do it? He did it to show a symbol of his status as a scientist. He wanted to be respected by others and to show um, that it, that is credible. And so being scientific gives that to psychology. People are saying, well, yes, we will listen to psychologists because they are scientists. And even other scientists will do that. So I'm going to give you the fist bump. Yeah, some respect there um, from other scientists and start listening. OK, so why would John Bowlby and others not be scientific? Why would they take a different approach? Well, first of all, if you are clinically organizing, taking away extraneous variables, you're changing what is going on. It's not like real life. You know, um, Elizabeth Loftus, those students watching exactly the same film of those accidents is not like seeing a real accident. It's very different. And so if you take a non-scientific approach, you can get into real life. You can accept all of the extraneous variables and still look at behavior and come up with something that reflects what is going on in real life. 
You can't measure the breadth of behavior scientifically. There are some things you just can't measure. Um, you can't objectively measure um, thoughts, feelings, opinions um, in a clearly, truly objective way. Um, and the unconscious mind, most definitely that's out the board. So yes, there are some things we can look at, but there are some things that we find very difficult to measure um, using the principles of science. And then there's this other idea of the depth of human thought. Yeah? The idea that um, scientific measurements tend to be quite su superficial, very simple measurements. But if we wanted to understand the relationship between someone and their mother, um, that has to be more complex, has to be deeper, there has to be depth there. And so when somebody gives that information out, a researcher needs to interpret that. There's no systematic tool that you can do to measure that. And so it allows us to measure more complex, deeper things um, if we take a non-scientific approach. Okay. So, which one's right? Albi, Rain, I'll let you work that one out um, there, but both have their place. Okay, what have we learned today? First of all, that most psychologists strive to use the principle of science because they want to establish rules of human behavior or thought that makes them nomothetic. Okay, that the biological, behavioral, and the cognitive approaches, they're the ones that really are in the science camp. They're really in camp there. They want to clearly use the principles of science. The positive approach would like to be there, but does acknowledge that sometimes that's limited with some of the things that they look at. The, the psychodynamic approach really have rejected that science aspect of it in order to look at different types of behavior, be more subjective, and to look at the ideas of the unconscious mind um, and more deeper ideas. That being scientific is good because you can repeat and it's reliable, you can establish cause and effects and make predictions and that you can use, you have a solid basis to apply it, um, make applications and that it gives respect. However, it does lack ecological validity. You are limited on what you can measure and the depth you can measure. And that is why some have taken more non-scientific approach. Well, I hope you've learned something today. You've made it through. I'd like to thank you for being with me on my video and Take care.